uh, please welcome uh, Guido Van Rossum. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the real title of this talk is Writing a Peg Parser for Fun and Profit. Because I'm a languages guy, I'm a languages nut, I'm really mostly just a parsing nut, so. Uh, well, actually, James Bennett explained it all. What is a parser? It's part of a compiler. So the compiler takes the source code and turns it into, well, in our case, bytecode. And it goes through stages. There's a tokenizer, so the tokenizer sort of analyzes the source code and turns it into useful things like there's print, there's a parenthesis, there's a string literal, there's another parenthesis, then there's something that you didn't really see in the source code, a new line token, but it's very much a token. Uh, even indents and dedents have tokens. Then there's the parser, and almost all the rest of the talk is about the parser, which produces from that sequence of tokens an abstract syntax tree. And I got an idea from James to uh, just show what that tree looks like. I'm terrible at drawing on computers, so apparently uh, I have to use text, but that's, that's a, an abstract syntax tree for me. And then you get bytecode, which kind of look like, looks like that, and you don't really want to know what that does, but it, except it does print hello world. So parsers and grammars are closely related, but of course, they're different. The parser is code. It has a lot of code. In fact, a typical parser has so much code that I didn't really, don't really want to show you the code. It's way more than that bit of bytecode there. Uh, a grammar, on the other hand, is a relatively simple thing. Like, here is an, a, a grammar that describes very simple arithmetic expressions. You can add and subtract and multiply and divide, and you can even put things in parameters parentheses, uh, and it's all four lines. This, this corresponds to, I don't know, between 50 and 100 lines of code or so. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to write all that code to parse that language because we, because we can take something called a parser generator uh, that takes the grammar as input and produces a parser as output. So now we see that the sort of von Neumann thing where uh, data is also code because the output of the parser generator is, from the parser generator's perspective, it's data. But then from the compiler's perspective, it's code. It's the code of the, the, of the parser. So that's the thing that turns the tokens into a parse tree. Now, parser generators are a dime a dozen to the point that even in the early 70s when a parser generator named Yak was created, it was already called yet another compiler compiler. <laughs> So they're fun to write, which is why, as uh, Chris said in 1989, literally the first thing I did when I thought I'm going to implement my own language was, uh, okay, let's shave this other yak first, which is I'm going to build my own parser generator. And I had some decent reasons for it, but mostly it was just for sport. Uh, I originally wrote it in C, then in 2004 or so, I rewrote it in Python, and that eventually made it into the standard library, and uh, now the original pgen is completely dead and also replaced by a copy of the Python version. But it, it does the same thing, and, and, and I feel it's essentially a dead end. It's an LL1 uh, parser that, that gets generated. Actually, it's mostly tables that get generated that uh, run a little push, that, 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 that are sort of driving a little push down, down automaton. The key thing is that it has a single token look ahead. Uh, so it looks at one token. I, I had this great image in my mind, and I, I couldn't find the right vi uh, video uh, support for it. Like, there's a thing in railroading called a hand car which is like three or four wheels uh, with a seat in it, or, or maybe two. And I was thinking, uh, the parser is this little hand car. In front of the hand car is a guy who looks at the code, which is written between the railroad ties. Uh, and he picks up one token at a time, and he has this huge rule book next to him. And uh, he maybe flips to a different page in the rule book, and he throws the thing over his back, where there's a whole stack of things. And every once in a while, he grabs a few things from his stack and wraps them in a package and puts, them, puts the package back on the stack. Anyway, that's what the push-down automaton does. Uh, 
And that's, that's how, yeah, like, yaks or bisons nowadays parser works as well. Uh, the one thing that, that sort of sets PGen apart, at least which set, set it apart 30 years ago when I wanted my own parser generator, my excuse was that uh, I could use EBNF, which is like extended Becker's normal form or Becker's Nauer form, so you can sort of use plus for repeat x one or more times or star for repeat x perhaps many times or perhaps zero times or question mark, like maybe there is an x here or not. A uh, bunch of other things. Uh, the other thing that PGN did, which at the time I was very proud of, which is that it automatically generates a parse tree for you. Uh, so if you had an, a, gr a grammar like that little expression thing, you would automatically get a, grammar, a, a parse tree that gives you an expression node, and the expression node has like a term child and a plus child and another term child, and the term child has a factor child, and the factor child has a, has a name child, and so on. Uh, over the years, eventually, we, we also started recognizing the downsides of PGN. Oh, I, should, I should add one more sort of positive thing about PGN. Because it was a fairly sort of restricted paradigm, uh, especially in the early years, it sort of kept us honest when we were proposing new features for Python. Because we always said, well, if, it, if we can't write the grammar for it using pgen, then we don't want to implement the, f the, the feature. Then apparently the, the, the syntax you're proposing is too hard to parse, and it's probably also going to be too hard for humans. But we actually violated our, all, our own rule there for various very useful things like assignments. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, pgen does not support left recursion. Uh, so instead of an expression node that can have as its left uh, child another expression node, which is how A plus B plus C really ought to be interpreted, you have to say, well, it can be a term followed by any number of additional things that are each a plus or minus operator followed by another term. And so now if you have A plus B plus C, it's term plus term plus term. Uh, but now the code generator has to sort of essentially parse that parse tree node and see, OK, well, we have an expression node. And well, let's see how many uh, children it has. Does it have like 2n plus 1 children? Then there are uh, n uh, interesting things happening or something like that. So the the idea that it generates the parse the parse tree automatically is true but it's not a very useful parse tree and uh literally 2 plus 2 equals 5 is correct as far as the python's formal grammar is concerned and then we have a separate pass that says well wait to look wait a second on the left of that assignment operator we're looking for uh, something that's an assignment target, and many things that are expressions are also assignment targets, like x, comma, y, comma, z inside square brackets uh, is an assignment target. But 2 plus 2 is not an assignment target, and so that's what that second pass has to figure out. Uh, it turns out that the parse tree changed every time we had to sort of refactor the grammar, which happened regularly when we added some feature that, that sort of so something like adding a weight to the grammar changed the, 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 the parse tree produced by pgen dramatically. Uh, so we didn't want to have to modify the, the bytecode generator, which is a really complicated, kind of sensitive piece of code, every time we refactor the grammar, because often after the refactoring, the parse tree looks completely different, but the meaning is still that the code you wanted to generate for it, for most cases, is still the same. So we added a sort of a distinction between a concrete syntax tree, which is what PGN produces, and an abstract syntax tree, which is what you would really like to have, and which w is what now the code generator uh, consumes as its input. Uh, and so now there is a translation program that goes from the concrete to the abstract syntax tree. Uh, 
And so when we refactor the grammar, we only have to change that part. When we refactor the grammar and we also add a feature, of course, we still have to also uh, update the bytecode compiler. You have to compile code somehow. Uh, but it, it turns out that that translation was non-trivial. I, I looked, it re really was almost 6,000 lines of C code. And it, it, it is still pretty sensitive. I mean, adding the walrus operator was a major operation just because we had to update that, uh, that thing a lot. Also, uh, now we have two trees that represent the entire program that have to be in memory at the same time. So, peg, a new shiny object. Uh, as I said, I like parsers, so, well, I didn't immediately, when PEG was invented, sort of jump at the occasion, but people pointed it out to me a few times, and uh, for the last time was earlier this year, and I finally thought, hmm, PEG actually looks kind of interesting, and I, I sort of have a few things I want to do to Python uh, that might be much easier if we had a different grammar than the stupid 30-year-old uh, PGEN. Uh, so, okay. Uh, also, PEG, PEG sort of has a completely different approach to parsing. It actually uses infinite look-ahead, which means that you essentially have all the tokens for the entire program in memory. Uh, but yeah, memory's cheap. I mean, this, this, this is still sort of the representation of a program, which is a very small amount of data compared to like one photo that you just took off the screen. <coughs> So, it turns out that there is a little add-on thing where you can make PEG support left recursion easily. Uh, in general, PEG has more power uh, because of the infinite look-ahead, so you can make grammars that actually look more natural and that sort of describe the feature. So, essentially, we don't have to put so many lies in the documentation because the... the the documentation claims that it shows the grammar. Well, the grammar that the documentation shows is very good for sort of understanding what, what it means, but it, that grammar is completely different from what, the, what PGEN actually consumes. Uh, PEG also has some other features that I'm not sure how useful they will be, look-ahead assertions especially. Uh, mo I think that's mostly used to rule out ambiguities in, in certain grammars that Python probably will never have. Uh, and then, uh, since I'm starting over, I might as well add actions, which is more or less the, the actions, the things in curly braces that you, that you know from, uh, say, from Yak or Bison. Uh, and using those actions, we can generate the AST directly, which at least saves us uh, all the complexity of uh, translating the CST to the AST. And it saves us a little bit of memory, which we then, of course, use to... Uh, keep all that infinite look ahead for the tokens. So there are many, again, there are many PEG, PEG generators already on the market, uh, but none of them sort of did exactly what I wanted, or at least I couldn't figure out how to make them do exactly what I wanted, so I thought I'd uh, explore this as my hobby project, because I was already sort of exploring retirement. So what, what I've been doing, and I forget when I started, I think the first blog post came out sort of late in the summer. I, I wrote, oh, hey, there's music. <laughs> uh, I actually wrote several PEG generators. The first version I wrote uh, generates Python code, and it works, and we eventually sort of got it to the point where it can also, there's also a metagrammar that describes the, the inputs to the parser generator. Uh, then I said I wanted to blog about it. Uh, that, that sort of got out of hand. I've, I've got nine episodes by now. Maybe the end is, is near. Uh, and uh, so for the blog post, I started from scratch with a much cleaner version that, that was easier to explain. Uh, and then at some point, I also sort of took version one and refactored it, well, actually, with the help of Pablo, who is one of the Python core devs. He's in, based in London. Uh, we refactored the original generator so that it can also generate C code, which was my ultimate goal. Uh, in September, uh, during the core development sprint, 
uh, I hacked on a grammar that can actually parse all of Python, at least as far as I can tell. Emily, another core dev, wrote a test program that sort of takes this parser and parses a whole directory full of files with it and tells you which files uh, succeed and which files fail to parse. Uh, and then <coughs> once we had that test program, I just mostly iterated myself on uh, small subsections of the standard library every time I found programs that couldn't be parsed yet, uh, I added some tweak to the, to the grammar until I could parse everything. And then I found out that there are like about nine files in the standard library that, are, that have syntax errors in them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turns out then, upon further inspection, that those are all test cases for lib223 and a few other uh, parts. So it's, it's not so bad. But the good news is that, that without having done any particular optimization, this thing parses about as fast as the original pgen generated parser, even though the, the, sort of the technology involved is, is, is much more advanced. But at least we didn't lose uh, any speed. We lost, we lost a bit of memory, but uh, there's still hope that I can optimize that out. So now let's, let's look at how PEG actually works. So there, of course, there's the, the generator that produces the parser, and there's the runtime. The generator just takes the grammar, and it actually it doesn't generate parsing tables. It generates a recursive descent parser. It actually generates code. For every, for every rule in the grammar, it generates a function or a method uh, that can recognize that part of the grammar. And uh, whenever a rule references not a rule, the function just calls another function. And we have high hopes that the C stack is big enough to parse uh, reasonably compl complex parsers, uh, programs. And if not, there's probably, there, I, I know there's a way to, to sort of turn all this inside out and generate parsing tables again for some kind of push down, down automaton if we need to. Uh, oh yeah, the, the, the generator also takes the actions, which actually are uh, C expressions or Python expressions, depending on which language the parser is written in, uh, that you generate. So if you generated Python code, you have actions that are Python expressions and so on for C. So those are inserted in the right spots in the generated functions. And then at runtime, uh, we have additional support for memoization, which I'll explain in a bit, uh, for left recursion. Uh, and then when it recognizes a, a rule, it executes the action to produce a bit of, of uh, the AST. Uh, OK, let's start with a truly trivial grammar. An expression is either a term plus another term or just a single term. So you can do 2 plus 2, but you can do 1 plus 2 plus 3. We can, you can also do x plus y. Uh, so name and number, anything in all caps, is actually a token type. It's not a, a, a rule. Uh, and one thing of note is that this is all tied fairly closely to Python's tokenizer. Uh, and Python's tokenizer sort of recognizes certain multi-character symbols, like plus equals is recognized as a single token. On the other hand, plus plus is not a special Python token, so that's just two plus tokens. Uh, let's see what we do with the simple grammar. So here is a very naive version of a parser that corresponds to that grammar. So the grammar is two lines. It's either a term plus a term or a term, and then a term is a name or a number. And so here's a function. Now, the function just returns true or false, uh, and it moves the input pointer. Uh, so it's, 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 it's hardly a parser, but it's sort of, if all is, after all is said and done, you either, it either says true, and then it sort of the input has been moved past the last token that was part of what it recognized, the expression. Or it says false, and then the, the input pointer is still where it was. 
so we can also explicitly manipulate the input po pointer, which is just a counter in the array of tokens. Uh, mark gives us the current input pointer. Uh, reset sets the input pointer to something. So if we say pause is mark, and I don't know if I can point. No, I cannot point. Well, you can, re you can read pause is mark there. Uh, Later, we call reset pause that just sort of rewinds to the start of the expression. Uh, expect uh, is something that either consumes a token and returns true, or uh, if that particular token is not there, uh, it returns false and leaves the input where it is. Uh, so an expression is a term followed by a plus followed by a term, as you can still sort of see here. Uh, then if we didn't recognize something with a plus, then we reset the position, we go again. Let's say if there's just a simple, simple, a simple term, uh, turns out there is maybe, uh, then we return true. If not, then just, I don't know, we technically we don't need to reset the position at this point because the term function itself also has this property that it either succeeds and move the input or fails and doesn't move the input. Uh, but just in case, uh, we reset the position and then we return false because we didn't find an expression, sadly. So the term function does a similar thing, except because that is so simple, we can just say return name or number. <coughs> uh, let's see, let's show the same action uh, with a very, s sorry, the same grammar with a very simple action added to it. Uh, the action is we, we create an add node, uh, say that that's some predefined class. Uh, the action needs to be able to reference uh, sub-expressions of the alternative that it's atta attached to, of course. So we can name the term, so the first term is x and the second term is y. Uh, the plus doesn't get a name because we don't actually reference it directly. Uh, the simple ex alternative where there's just a term, th where there's no action, and there's supposed to be a default action that says uh, if there is an alternative has only one item, then we return re re the action, just the default action just returns whatever that item was. Uh, so term also doesn't need any actions because it will just return a name or a number node. Uh, let's see, I think we have everything there. <coughs> so what the parser generator, the simplest form of the parser generator actually produces for this is not exactly this, but it's pretty close. It does use the walrus operator, so it only, this is all very forward looking, so it only only works with Python 3.8 or uh, probably with uh, 3.9 as well, the master. Uh, so there's a toy parser class which inherits from a par parser base class. Parser, I'm, I'm not showing that, but it just defines the mark and expect and reset functions. So again, uh, we save the current input position by calling mark, except now mark is a method. Uh, we call the term and the expect plus and the, uh, another term call. So if any of those fail, the, I the whole if fails. Uh, if they all succeed, we have x and y assigned to. Uh, then we return that add node. So otherwise, we reset. Uh, and the default action, well, it has to, ha to have some, some variable that it can return. So it will say uh, return, return that term. Uh, the term function is, uh, the term method is pretty simple. Okay, I'll, 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 a little later I have a little demo where, where I, I'll actually show that in action, if I can get it working. So there's one problem with this, this example, even this very simple example has, has one issue, or it demonstrates an issue, which is that the first and the second uh, alternative for X for both start with term. Now suppose that term is a complicated thing. Uh, and if we have an input that is just a term, because of the ordering of the alternatives, which in general is, is actually important for uh, PEG, you, you try the alternatives in, in order until one succeeds. So 
we try term plus term and we get as far as the end of the first term and then we look forward and see is there a plus and there is not a plus. Then we reset and then we try again looking for a term. Uh, what happens at this point is uh, everything works, but we, we parse that sub-expression term twice. Uh, so because everything is completely uh, deterministic I here when you're parsing the input. I mean, we're, we're caching the tokens in memory, so there's no chance that if the file changed uh, the second time you, you try to, to parse that sub-expression, it'll look different. Uh, so we, ch we can memorize this. Basically, if you call a function, if you call the same function at the same input position, we know, we know that its effect is going to be the same. So it either succeeds and moves the input position uh, a number of tokens on, or it fails and doesn't move the input. And we cache that. We cache both the success or the failure of a function call. And then if somehow the parser in any context calls that same function again with the same input, uh, we can sort of save all the effort of parsing that sub-expression. We just return the cached AST node uh, and move the input pointer forward. And so this, this is, there's a theory result that says uh, this way you actually parse in linear time. Uh, it's called pack rat parsing. I think it was invented by the same guy who invented PEG because they really go hand in hand. PEG without pack rat parsing is hopeless. I guess pack rat parsing is useful for other types of parsers, though. Uh, so at least in the Python version of the, the code generator, this can be done with a memorized decorator. Uh, left recursion, the other thing that sort of makes PEG attractive from my perspective uh, let's first show it without actions. Now we have a slightly more complex grammar. It has the same number of rules, but the first rule is actually an expression, is an expression followed by a term or just a term. So that's left recursive. In old pgen, that was statically an error. The, the, code gen, the pgen says you can't do that, uh, and it can tell. Uh, Classic PEG without left recursion support also can tell and uh, says you shouldn't do that. But there is a hack, and I'll show how that works. It's just like with actions, it looks the same as the previous one. Uh, so, okay, actually, <laughs> I'm, 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 and I, I wrote that line a few days ago, but I knew what, what time I was in the schedule. And this, this I mean, Really, I, I sort of, I found a wiki page, or I was pointed to a wiki page that had the description, and I tried to read it, and it was complicated, and it pointed to a paper and tried to read the paper, and the paper was like hopeless, I can't read theoretical papers. And I thought about it and went back to the wiki page, and then I peeked in some code that actually implemented the whole thing, and finally it, it sort of, my penny dropped and I realized how it works. And there is sort of, you, you set the recursion limit. You say expert is left recursive, but this particular call to expert can, you know, at this position can only recurse n times. And when it tries to recurse for the n plus one time, we'll just artificially say there is no expert here. And then we come, because sort of the expert function is still generated exactly the same way, it will just try the second alternative. Is the f if the first alternative that's le left recursive fails, it just tries the other alternative. Uh, and so you start with like the smallest possible recursion limit, like zero or one, I forget which, you know, which one it is, but sort of the one that you start with. And regard the first time, regardless of whether you have a success or a failure, you bump the recursion limit by one, and then you try again. Uh, if the second time you get a result that is a success and that is longer than the first time, you keep doing this. You bump the recursion limit one more and you try again. Uh, and you keep doing this until you either get a result that is a failure or you get a result that is not longer than the, prev the, the previous one. And again, there's, there's theory that says that this works. I try to understand it and for a very simple case, 
I think I sort of follow the proof on paper. In general, it's, it's again, it's, it's above my, my level of understanding, but I, I trust that it works. And in practice, it works beautifully because that, that pr grammar for all of Python that I created is full of left recursion, even a few uh, sort of mutually uh, recursive rules. Uh, it turns out that the memorization cache was a really good idea because the memorization cache is essentially abused to implement the recursion limit because you prime the cache with uh, a failure result and then sort of you call the, the function that the decorator is wrapping once and if it returns something that you want to keep, you sort of stuff that back into the cache and then you, you go again. It's, 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 it's beautiful, but it's also uh, pretty tough to follow if if you haven't spent half a day uh, trying to understand it. There's, there's, there's one more thing. There's a little bit of graph analysis you have to do to d even know whether something is left recursive. And there are some strange edge cases, but graph analysis is easy. Uh, OK, I had some demos planned, and I think the demos are actually the best part. Uh, so bad grammars can be get pretty complicated. And because there is this thing where you have to put the longest alternative first, especially when two alternatives might start with the same sub-expression, sub uh, because peg just sort of, as, as soon as an alternative succeeds, it's going to pick that one. And because of the memoization and various other things, it's never, ever going to try any following alternatives. Uh, so every once in a while, you write your grammar and you test it, and some, you, it doesn't recognize what you want or it doesn't reject what you expect it to reject. And then you end up debugging it. And the first version, I put in a whole bunch of logging, and I spent a lot of time making the logging nice, but it was still really hard. And then for the, for the blog posts, I decided to actually uh, create a visualizer. Now, it turns out that visualizers for parsing algorithms are also a dime a dozen. I don't know if I've seen another one that was written using curses, though. Uh, <laughs> so let me see. Where is my other window? OK, I think here's my first demo. So this is the grammar. Uh, ignore that first line start just means uh, that's where we start the parser generator. And then it's it's this non-left recursive uh, version. So the, this is the parser generator generating stuff. This is the generated code. Uh, I wasn't kidding that the generated code is longer than the grammar. <coughs> this is the input. We're parsing a very simple thing, ABC plus 1. OK, and so here's the visualization. And so the screen is divided in three sections. The middle section actually is where the input will appear. And there's one thing I didn't explain, which is that we actually parse the input incrementally. Uh, so we sort of we only ask for the next token from the input file when the grammar really, really wants to know what the next token is. On top, we have what essentially we build up the stack of uh, calls. So start calls expert, calls term, calls uh, expect and so on. Uh, at the bottom, we'll see things appear that end up being memorized. So let's start. We start with the start function being called. So the start function uh, has only one alternative, and it has only one item. So we're going to try that. OK, so now we're calling expert. And the underline shows us that that's where we are. Uh, expert is term plus term, or, or t just term. So we're going to try the first item of the first alternative, which is a term. So we're calling term. Term is name or number. And we still haven't looked at the input. We're still just sort of in the recursive calls of the, the, the parser. So now we're going to expect a name. Uh, and now, yeah, now, now it's, it's, it's do or die. Uh, so yeah, we look at the input. And there, of course, there's a token, ABC. Uh, so that is, in fact, a name. So uh, this succeeds. Expect returns ABC. Then term succeeds. And 
I guess I lied about the default action. Uh, it actually produces some kind of default node that says there was a, we recognize a term and the only thing in the term was ABC. Okay, so now that expert uh, is going to look ahead, now it's going to expect a plus. Uh, the things we already recognized sort of sync down to the memoization cache. We're calling expect plus. By the way, the indentation here corresponds to the input position. That's important because we're now, we're now expecting a plus at the input position after the first token. So we look, is there a plus? Yes, there's a plus. Uh, so now we're going to recognize the third ter term. So now again, that, that plus, and here below you also see that expect plus is cached at the input position where there was a plus. So now we're looking for a term again. Uh, term is a name or a number. We're expecting a name. No, it's not a name. Now we're going to try a number. Yes, we're going we're to call expect for a number. Notice that expect for a name there's, is cached also. There was no name here. Negative caching is important because we have a one. So is that a number? Yes, it is a number. So now we have a term. So now we have the whole first alternative for expert. Uh, and uh, that returns some successful uh, thing. Uh, and now we're back, sort of, we, we, we rewound the call stack to the start function, which is also ready. And this is, this is the output. So we recognize the start, we recognize an expression, we recognize the term. Uh, that's all there is. Okay, it blinks to tell me that there's no more. We can also run the visualization backwards if you wanted to, if you sort of, you came across something interesting and you thought, oh, whoa, what happened there? Yeah, so now we're going forward again. Uh, that was fairly nasty to implement the going backward part, when I, because I hadn't <laughs> planned that. <laughs> okay, the second demo, quick, because we're, we're technically out of time. Uh, it's the same grammar. So not so interesting. This, ha this uh, version adds the memoization code, though. Uh, I think that's, that's what's the case. And maybe I. Oh, it's a demo one still, huh? Hence, uh, OK, this is more complex. This is the left. Oh, yeah, this is the left recursive one. It actually may be a little uh, complicated for this late. Let's let's walk through it. It's not much. Okay, the star means is the recursive rule. So you see that expert calls expert, but they're yeah, going back. Yeah, so we the the, the sort of the setup for the rec left recursive expert call primes the memoization cache with a none. And so uh, expert calls itself recursively it says, is there an expert here? And that call goes to the cache, and it says there is no expo there. So we immediately proceed to the second alternative. Uh, is there a left paren? There, there's not. Is there an atom? Atom is a name or a number in this grammar. Yep, 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 yep. OK, so that was the recursive call. And now we do another recursive call with a uh, different, okay, with going back a little bit again. Uh, yeah, if so, once we go back here, we sort of the cached version for expert changes to we, we, we had this whole node with ham in it. Uh, and now we go recursive again. Uh, check if there's a plus. Term is not very interesting. Yeah, that's a name. Okay, now so we recognized everything. So we put that in the cache because it's longer than we got before. And then we go again. And we find the same thing in the cache. We see if there's another plus, expect plus at this further indented position. But no, there's a new line there, actually. This is the first time that we see the new line token. So we go back to the second alternative, which immediately gives us this result. And now, uh, going back again a little bit, 
at this point, the left recursion uh, logic detects that the new result was uh, not longer than the old result. So it says, OK, we, g we got the longest we can get, uh, so we're done here. And that's how left recursion works. Uh, and I had a third demo, but it's not all that interesting. Uh, so I'm going to go back to my slides, if I can get there. And this is all I have left. Uh, what's next? So now that we have the full grammar for Python, we have to develop actions for it. Uh, turns out some guy in Berlin is interested in helping with that. Uh, I imagine it's also easily sort of, it's, it's a di distributable system. Multiple people can work on developing actions for different parts of the grammar. So if people want to help, please uh, uh, drop me a note. Uh, once we have enough actions, we have to test everything. And that includes what we currently don't have, te generating tests somehow for things that don't, f don't parse because we also need to be confident that the new parser rejects the same collection of inputs as the old parser. Now we have to benchmark it, and I'm, I'm, I'm fully expecting that the benchmark will show that either the memory usage is out of hand or it's still slower than the old parser, and that doesn't make a very good case for the rest of the core devs to allow me to do all this stuff. Uh, and then, there's going to be this, this sort of gut-wrenching review. Is, 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 is that grammar really more readable after you added all those actions and everything? Can we do things with it that, that sort of we couldn't do with pgen, or at least would be really hard with pgen, or where pgen would say sort of, yeah, do whatever, and then the second pass has to uh, sort it all out? Uh, and, and do we actually want to do things? And then, so the, the one thing I have in mind, which definitely is going to be a, a release after we potentially introduce this in, uh, in CPython, uh, which is a match statement. So if you're interested in match statements, hang in there. Uh, anyway, I think we have about six months before uh, beta one, which is the feature freeze. So wish me luck and thanks. Thanks, Guido.